Thank you, Dr. Bird. Um, not only did I graduate from here, but I just wanted to acknowledge the role that Dr. Bird played in me even graduating at all. Um, when I met Dr. Bird, it was fall of 2005, and I was right on the cusp of honestly just dropping out. Um, I was a single parent, soon to have a child, and just didn't know if it was the right fit to keep going. And she really encouraged me, and then she encouraged me to keep going and to keep going. So um, not only have I learned from her as, as a writer, but I really wouldn't be where I was without her just come alongside me when I was struggling and just seeing that I had a gift and to do something with it. So just thank you for that eternally. Um, so uh, the book, Into the Left Over Blue, was a long time in the making. Uh, it probably took me about three years to write it, and it took about three times that to um, actually find a publisher for the entire thing. So for those of you who are writing, let me encourage you that it is a long process, um, but, but a good one. So uh, the text itself, if you have your copy with you, um, it is divided into six different sections. And the sections are all um, excerpts from a work by Ayn Rand called Anthem. And uh, you might know Ayn Rand, her more famous works are Fountainhead and Atlas Shrugged. Some of the ideas are controversial, but one of the texts that I really liked of hers was Anthem. And Anthem um, comes from a dystopian world where the concept of the self has been disintegrated. And so uh, the pronoun I does not exist. And so the first five sections of the book um, deal with this character before um, he has come to the recognition of the self. And so the last section, you'll notice, shifts into the first person to mimic that book. Um, but I mined probably all the sources I could to, to write this book. I read all the first-hand accounts that I could find of it. I read all the, the books documenting the history of the flu pandemic, and I kept coming back to this idea, how could something this big have been forgotten? And uh, if you've ever experienced any kind of personal loss, we can see that on a micro level too. You know, you lose someone and everyone comes alongside you the day of the funeral, but a year later they've disappeared. Not because they don't care, but just because life has moved on. And so this book really was a way to reconcile how do we remember these horrible tragedies, big and small, and at the same time, how do we move on from them? So I'll start with the first poem. <clears throat> it's called Dangling Maladies in the Aftermath. And there's a quote here from uh, John M. Barry, who wrote the, the big uh, book on the influenza pandemic, and he uh, documented this. Spain actually had very few cases of the flu before May, but the country was neutral during the war. That meant the government did not censor the press, and unlike French, German, and British newspapers, Spanish newspapers were filled with reports of the disease. So we often call the 19 inf uh, 1918 influenza strain the Spanish flu, and that, that was why. I thought that was very interesting. All right. She does not know how to write an, of an event that kills 50 million, an episode they cannot solve or properly forgive, since so few wonder about a couple sets of hemorrhagic lungs. All the while, the central powers are sending nasty telegrams. Some say it is all a misnomer, that the Spanish have no rhyme or reason to be the namesake of the pandemic. For Christ's sake, name it after the dirty Germans, though the beginning is here. Perchance Wilson on April 3, 1919, at the Paris Peace Conference, coughs too heavily to properly construct a treaty that would prevent another war. Could they surmise that La Gripe killed more than 50 million? Maybe maims, dare say murders, millions, millions, millions. Such a malady is the envisionment of seething doctors because it is beyond the realm of cures, rearranges the alphabets of statistical distribution. Now that she reads the books, they came like swallows, pale horse, pale rider, one of ours, memories of a Catholic girlhood, the last town on earth, sees the pictures, touches the data, she can pick this from a lineup and identify the vicious cause effects into the swells of the 21st century. But she is no closer to peace with the radicalism, though it is far away and twice removed. Isn't it always the little things that kills them? She sees him the vestiges of a room full of cancer. She does not know how to write of an event that killed one man, an episode she cannot solve or properly forgive him for since, uh, for since so few asked anything that year after his death by organs gnawed with tumors. All the while, the functions in her own body are sending nasty telegrams that demand life go on. 
Uh, the next one I want to read is, is the poem following right after that, and it's called The Birthright of Stones. Okay, and this is actually dedicated to a, a family who uh, lost a, a young man in his early 20s in a, a motorcycle accident. So interspersed with this big narrative, um, events uh, I watched firsthand, um, people around us had suffered with loss, and so sometimes they found a place in, in these poems. The dying men leave a milestone of what went wrong. The dying men have been made of brass and ideology before they had nothing left to say. The dying men have been effaced stamps from a revolution followed by madmen. The dying men have been remembered by parents who became worn through from burlap colored tragedy. The dying men are succeeded by women who have souls of lapis lazuli buried within volcanic ash. The dying men have children who will always fear being left behind. The dying men are defined as war wounds, cancer cells, fallen planes, flu viruses, motorcycle accidents, explanations that cannot speak for how the wind shifts as they walk away from a name on a stone made of their emptiness. Okay. All right. um, the next one I want to look at um, comes from section two. And here we see the, narr it's the narrative arc beginning to form. Um, uh, I create a character here who I refer to as uh, the inspector, which is myself, <laughs> as I was uh, just uncovering all the history and all the mystery surrounding this tragedy of 1918 that people forgot about. And um, so the inspector really is just um, an another name for um, myself as I'm you know, trying to, to learn more about this piece. Um, so this is the first piece, and uh, if you'll notice, it's written in prose poetry. Uh, while these are all free verse poems, I do use prose poems uh, at times. I've I found a lot of success with the form. So, um, all right, page 12, the creation of an inspector. This must be some new kind of infection or plague. William Henry Welch, the first dean of Johns Hopkins Medical School. After the girl becomes half an orphan, she begins to unravel the tinseled esophagus of a swan. After the girl becomes half an orphan, she questions that coalesce, or she asks questions that coalesce within madness precisely adjacent to the epicenter of a graveyard. After the girl becomes half an orphan, she begins to unravel. After the girl becomes half an orphan, she asks, after the girl, after. Okay. All right. Um, and I'll I'll go ahead and read the one as well uh, on page 14. This was actually one of the earlier um, poems that I had written, um, but as I assembled the book, it didn't, it didn't come first. Uh, sometimes when you are assembling a manuscript, things do not go in the order in which you write it. It just does not work that way. So, um, all right, the next one is uh, The Origin of Species, and I'm sure most of us are familiar. That is a, a reference to uh, Charles Darwin uh, and his, his work. All right. All right. Inspector, tonight they do not want to write. They want to be as persuasive as melted cream, as a cross-hatched monologue, as an overwhelmed, well, overwhelmed eccentricity. Take these poems like a stillborn youth, a rotted paragraph. Influen uh, Inspector, the influenza of 1918 is a pandemic. Disease is no respecter of persons, or of nouns, the persons, place, things. 50 million humans are not life as rodents. The Great Plague was gymnastics for the skins, bones, fluids of rats and flea stowaways. Inspector, there was a man blue as sapphires. He was beautiful as a wicked architect. There was a man, there was a man, there was not a man. The woman had lovely, had ruby orbs across her cheeks, those fallacious apples, that lovely foam. Inspector, they are maddened with silence. Her eyes are hard as iron needles, her words as sharp as branches. We are made of blood, and blood is made of us. War is a circle, and you are only a humiliated coincidence. Okay. Um, let's skip forward a little bit. If you want to go to uh, page 19, all right. <clears throat> this is all, a lot of this here is just a response outlining um, more of the historical documentation of the disease. All right, so this one's called Secretly and Unobtrusively. 
Inflammation of the lungs is a sign of a healthy body, so maybe Pfeiffer's bacillus caused the pandemic since they have no idea how to begin isolating viruses. Perhaps the flu is upstaged by an epilogue, pneumonia, wearing the cloak and dagger bacillus garb and is the player really the cause behind it all. Just like they have no idea if sex and economics are the motives like Freud and Marx say they were. She believes that the world really shudders and groans under the weight of such accusations, like a martyr repressing a deprecating smile. She sees them wailing loudest, loudest only when the dead fill the ground, and the loudest cause is not gunfire tanks, M1 Garens. It is the quietness in the coffin corners in the sputum of the gravel sec uh, secretive and unobtrusively entering the scene like a discarded sentiment, a resolve that does not exist years after it fades from memory. Okay, uh, I'm going to move forward a little bit. If you want to look, uh, follow along with me on page 31. Um, this one here has a little bit more, um, a little bit of more of the reference to the the personal side of the loss. Okay. Um, sorry, uh, this is called the intervals between. The silence of a tumor is manipulative as the ignorance of a vaccination or the refusal to interpret a quarantine. Such vacillating abscesses are not a springboard for the lecture of 1918. World War I monopolizes that. Such gruesome bones beneath his skin demands she sees that he cannot look her in the eye and say it will be all right. The mother says that it was different with cancer because it was unlike some kind of death in your face, invasive as someone else's dog. No, the whole affair is recondite as the harmonica of a masochist because all is so silent months before it ends. In the intervals between the W-shaped graphs, the decimated Samoans, the sickly doughboys, the diagnosis, the telling of the children, the uncomfortable inquiries, the forgotten year later, she sees eons of abdicated theses. In the intermission between a 1917 spring and a 1919 spring, or a January and a November, there resides all the times they said they'd be here and are not. Um, I'm going to flip forward a little bit and uh, read one on uh, page 33. Um, this one is called Of Gods They Shed. After the man peels an orange, he dedicates an act of loneliness to the collapsed allegory. The first brother says he tattooed because others say they see him. The second brother says he has tattooed because he sees himself. She wonders, as the air becomes salt, if they are penitent because he is gone or because this overture is the relic of opals. She asks them whether love is formed in Rorschach tests. They answer, ink does not tell the story, nor do the words. The stories tell us. No one seems to mind as the water, the sky becomes an embryo of gods. They shed like silky skin against a nectarine sunset. Um, right, I'll do just a couple more, then, then I'll stop there. Um, uh, on page 38, this one, um, was one of the uh, really successful pieces in the publishing process. Okay. Um, so we're working now towards the finale of, of the book. All right, it's called uh, On 38, Everything Afterwards Had Been. After the girl becomes an inspector, she learns the whereabouts of symptoms painted with lightning. After the girl becomes an inspector, she jettisons the cobblestones lodged in her grief. After the girl becomes an inspector, she finally sees that no diagnosis is without new respective parameters of love. After the girl becomes an inspector, she sees the flu that killed millions was only a prelude to her loss. After the girl becomes an inspector, she starts dreaming that he was never dead. After the girl becomes an inspector, she sees his eyes in the mirror like the man in the gym who held steel like a clever warlock. You must be Greg's daughter. After the girl becomes an inspector, she reads books everyone had forgotten. After the girl becomes an inspector, she uncovers that everything afterwards had been a response to loneliness of being a child adult. After the girl becomes an inspector, she frees her myth of soundlessness and erupts into stars. And um, this next one on page 54, um, is probably the most specific 
uh, in terms of uh, the personal loss here. The, the, near, the uh, point of view has shifted to first person. And this actually, this piece, The Survivors, on page 54, is the first one that I published. I thought that was um, fitting. And I dedicated this one to my brother, uh, for Jonathan. The day my father dies, the room is a suffocating diorama. The walls are thick and I exist inside the cogs of a watch. Fine, in fact, getting better, I say to someone the evening before the end. I'm curled into a chair disheveled as a schizophrenic manuscript. My brother screams, a voice against his throat, a sword grinding into bones. Grief is uglier than the lips of sneering gods and he is broken like a remembering soul. They wash his body, still wearing red and black flannel pajamas. He's handsome, cleaned up, the nurse says. I hate her for pretending there is loveliness in a world deteriorating as a ship embedded in a squall. When they bury him, the air was dry, my makeup flawless. Nothing sensory remains. The memories like survivors scattered across a moment. After I tear the shirt, I wore with scissors, then beat it senseless. Years later, I do not enter the Holocaust Museum because cancer is a garment that drapes the same as Auschwitz, Buchenwald, Treblinka, Dachau, where the world had gone to pieces. I'm not afraid of death. I'm afraid of what it looks like. And then I'll read, I'll read these last two. This, this is the uh, titular piece of the work on page 57. And then uh, I'll read the, the last one here. All right. So this is called Into the Leftover Blue. With the incantation of a yellow morning, the sun slips into an ethnic war. Where is the solvent that becomes a misrepresented scion? Unravel me into the leftover blue that becomes a promiscuous skyline. Here, see that? You are the feverish penmanship of cave walls. We are the hasty philosophies of Bedouin concrete. By setting a drink upon a table made of flesh or placing a hand upon the inner thighs of tulips, the narrative continues via pierced singers with red mohawks. All right, and then um, I'll wrap it up with this very last poem. So ultimately, this work excavates some pretty powerful human emotions. Um, grief, regret, anger, happiness. But um, I end it with hope because I believe that um, you can't stay in the suffering. You have to look at what comes next. And so this poem here is actually dedicated to all of my siblings. It's called What Comes Next for Allison, Joseph, Jonathan, Adria, and Jacob. The narrative is an unfinished antecedent for a renamed past. The narrative is the identity of exculpated madmen. The narrative is filed and labeled what not to do. The narrative is all that went wrong, though what comes next can go right. The narrative is, the anxiety medication, the rusted metal, the shutting out, the fear of abandonment, the stolen items, the empty chair, the anger that is the safest emotion, the child with dark eyes. The narrative is my jugular hold on ambition that hides loneliness until holidays. Here amidst the past sins, the narrative becomes an invitation to touch the ache that doesn't have to silhouette us anymore, my dear ones. All right. And that is a preview. Yeah. I actually started with this 
idea of making the cancer into a character. If any of y'all have heard of the book, um, The Emperor of All Maladies, I read that a few years ago and wished I had read that before I wrote this book. And I tried to shape it that way, but it didn't work. So, so I tried something different, but yeah, it's, but it does have such a presence. It almost does take on its own persona. So yeah, absolutely. So, yeah. Uh, yeah. I did. I didn't. Most. I looked for um, as many first-hand narratives as I could find, and most of those people who um, wrote a first-hand narrative also had it. But um, it would be interesting to follow up and see even the uh, the wake of the suffering afterwards. Um, the thing that I also found was really rare. Uh, but there's. I couldn't unless I missed it. I couldn't find any poetry written by first-hand. Um, survivors of the flu. Uh, Ellen Bryant Voigt does have a series called Kyrie, um, which, but she didn't experience it herself. But that actually is a, that's a cool idea. So, yeah. Um, uh, while doing the research, uh, even doing the research, uh, did you ever experience writer's block? And if so, uh, how did you overcome it? I did. Um, but I think because I was kind of forced to write some of these, I did take some of them to workshop. That, that made me work through the writer's block because I wanted to get a good grade. Um, but it, it got difficult sometimes to um, not get stuck on certain pieces. I would write something, it was so emotionally invested that I would want to stay there. What I have found in years past is just to sit down and write something. Um, I was telling um, Dr. Bird not long ago that um, I took a generative workshop this past summer and it really forced me to overcome the anxiety that I, I was out of ideas. So um, my maybe encouragement there would just be something will come out <laughs> if, you, if you write. So, but it is definitely um, difficult. And so yeah, I, I hear that, <laughs> absolutely. Yeah. So one of the things that I kind of can't help but to try to do is try to figure out what made the author pick certain titles mm -hmm. for um, certain things. So mm -hmm. specifically with the title to the first part, um, mm -hmm. I mean, it is a sin to write this. Could you explain? That yeah. Language? Yeah, that's the one. At, um, that is a quote that came from Ayn Rand's anthem. And I really just read the book again and found pieces that I thought represented um, uh, the, the sections. And if I remember the way, the way I did it, I think I read it and just found the quotes and then adapted the poems to fit the quotes. That seemed to work better. Um, it doesn't always work in every situation, but here it did. Um, so. And it, it's, it's, it's almost magical sometimes how the themes seem to connect, and then I just have to be aware of and connect the dots. So, yeah. Is that, yeah any other questions? Yeah. Uh, on page 33, you uh -huh. said, uh, they answer, ink does not tell the story, but nor do words. The story tells us. Mm -hmm. Was that like a turning point in your life when you began to analyze yourself internally? Were you going through something at that time? I think so. I think when I started seeing my siblings respond with something concrete to grief. I mean, is getting a tattoo for a loved one isn't necessarily something revolutionary, but it became interesting to me that that could just speak for itself, that we didn't always have to use words, you know, conversation tell a story. Sometimes a picture can suffice to, to tell it, and that's enough. And, it, um, and so I guess that was a, a way to, to redirect how to process the, the hurt, absolutely. So, yeah, good question. Yeah. I love your poetry reading, but I have a question about your degree. Yeah, what's that? I was wondering if you would say what's the best thing about getting a PhD in creative writing for you and what's the hardest Good question. Um, so for those of you who are considering, considering getting a PhD, um, if it is possible to do it before you have children, I'm going to encourage you to do that. I did not have that option in, in the meantime. Um, I am really glad I did it. Uh, I think it, it gave me a level of, um, uh, what's the word for it, of uh, a pride in my work. And it let me push something about myself that was completely separate from just trying to get through the day. Being a wife, being a mom, being a teacher, because um, I also teach as well, like Dr. Bird mentioned. And um, it just kind of gave me that ownership of that artistry. That's something people can't take away. Um, the difficult part was um, I was married, I had a child, and in the midst of all that I had a second child, so time management did become very challenging. Uh, but, but we made it work, and um, 
and the great thing is I'll get a raise at my job <laughs> in, in about you know six months once uh, we come back to the school year but um, it also the great thing about it is it gives me options so where I'm at now um, is a fantastic place to work but if I want to go somewhere else it gives me those opportunities and I wouldn't have had that um, solely with just a master's degree so it does open up the field a little bit more to for what you want to do with your life but yeah Anybody else? Yeah. Um, which piece was your oldest piece? Oh, gosh, probably. It's been a while, so I've kind of forgotten. Probably some of the earlier ones came from section. Um, believe it or not, probably from section um, section three. Those were probably some of the earlier ones, but many of them changed so much that I've combined and shifted them around. Um, but most of these started as stories about the pandemic. When I couldn't quite get that cancer character to figure in a way that worked, um, I just wrote about the pandemic and, um, and how all that was forgotten and shifted more so into the, um, the more personal poems. So probably the, the more recent ones uh, would be um, the ending of, of six, which makes sense. I mean, it's the last part of the book. So, yeah, but the, the writing process in terms of, uh, I don't know if any of you struggle with this, but when I write, I'm already thinking about where am I going to go publish this? And you, can, you can't work that way when you write. So, um, you know, as long as you just keep getting something on the page, it's going to come together. Um, I've put together now three or four different manuscripts, and uh, it's somehow it always comes together. So, oftentimes the biggest struggle is I just got to get out of my own head <laughs> and, and just sit down and write. And uh, having a, a community really helps you to do that. So hopefully you have people around you who are encouraging and supporting that as well. And so, yeah. Any questions? Oh, yeah. So I thought it was interesting in your perspective on how you got on the writer's block. Mm -hmm. Because I mean, I'm a writer too, specifically in music. Mm -hmm. And um, you know, I was on a list kind of like following the whole structure of like just writing anything and writing until it makes sense. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's really makes sense. But um, I think you kind of already answered it. I just mm -hmm. want to know, like, what was your inspiration to, to start writing and then what inspired you to focus specifically on that? I was hoping no one would ask that because it's embarrassing where I got this idea. Um, so maybe some of y'all remember the Twilight series about the vampires that came out several years ago. At the time I was teaching middle school and all my students were reading those books. So I thought, well, I'll read them too just to see what they're about. And that's where I encountered the idea of the pandemic. So I remember watching it on the couch and I just Googled it and read about it on Wikipedia. I thought, how do I not know about this? Because I was teaching history. And that's really where much of it started. And then from there, I thought, well, what if, what if this could become a character? And that didn't work. And so I just started writing about the stories. But yeah, it's certainly not the most scholarly or um, <laughs> prestigious way to find inspiration. But you know, it's all what you do with it, I guess. So there's, I guess, value to be found in pop culture is that message. <laughs> so yeah, that's where it started. And say, yeah. Anybody else? Oh, yeah. Let's see, two, probably 2006, and I think I finished it around, no, no, it would have been later than that, 2008, and then I probably finished it around 2010-ish, something like that, because I worked on it through my master's degree, and um, it took a while to put it together, longer than I thought I would. Um, and I think I spent more time revising this than I have anything else. So, all in all, several years to write it. But Considering what the things that you mm -hmm. just did here, mm -hmm. uh, did it prompt you to look at other uh, pandemics that have been devastating to, you know, the world in general? Like the black yeah. plague, this is obviously the Spanish influenza. Right. A little bit. Um, it did prompt me to read The uh, Emperor of All Malady, The Biography of Cancer. Um, so I, I read that piece. Uh, I read kind of just little bits here and there about um, the, the uh, bubonic plague, because that's one of the other events I knew that was so catastrophic. Um, so I read about that. Um, 
and I read a little, you know, kind of, I've kind of followed stories in the news about flu every year when it breaks out, but really this strain, I don't know if any of y'all are aware of this, this strain really isn't that different from the influenza pandemic of eight, 1918. Um, because this particular strain we have now is so aggressive, it's been attacking the young, and that's really what happened in the influenza 1918 pandemic. People who were so health were almost so healthy that their bodies worked against themselves. So I've kind of kept an eye on on how does the flu look today um, after that. But I haven't looked at anything other than cancer or um, a little bit about the bubonic plague. Not not in great depth. And so yeah, that's a good question there. Yeah. You mentioned that um, when you were writing this. Mm -hmm. Was there any There were some, yes, that I never did workshop. Some of, um, a lot of the prose ones I did workshop with um, Dr. Bird, but I had a handful in there that nobody saw it other than me, which can be scary sometimes because, you know, we often can get blinders to our own work. Um, but yes, there were some in here that it was just really, I just did the best I could. <laughs> so um, that, can, that can free you on some level to make the writing about your style, but at the same time, I know when I write, I, I miss stuff. So, but yeah. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, on the intervals of between, mm -hmm. uh, the last line, uh, there resides all of the times they said mm -hmm. they would be here mm -hmm. and they're not. Mm -hmm. um, I thought it was really interesting to give that vision of singular versus plural mm -hmm. in perspective. Yeah. Do you like originally come up with the Portuguese or? I wish, I wish I had. Like I'd read, an, I, at that point in my uh, academic career, I'd read enough uh, English articles from journals that had these really catchy titles with the parentheses where they could put two words in one. So I thought, oh, I'm gonna do that. that cause that's gonna work here. So I wish that was me being really creative, but it was not. So I stole that technique from, from other places. But it's amazing how much work it does. If you can make it fit, it, it really can be pretty powerful. So more than the dash. Yeah. Are there any pieces um, inside of this that is kind of like cringeworthy to you a little bit? Cause I know as a writer, like this I write poetry, mm -hmm. and it's making the papers. Mm -hmm. It's, I see now the way I write now, which is many years out from this. I look back and my vocabulary, I was intentionally much more um, elevated with diction. So I read what I wrote here and I thought, I don't know that I would put it that way today. I was actually just telling my mom that um, uh, some of the things I wrote from Signet years ago, I'm like, oh gosh, I don't, I don't want to read that. My daughters wanted to read some of my stuff. I'm like, I don't know where that magazine went. I just, you know, you, I guess you just can't read it. But yes, <laughs> you certainly see there can be a lot of growth even within the space of just first draft to workshop and first draft coming out. So years, years once you get distance from it can sometimes make you go, oh gosh, oh gosh. So yeah, <laughs> a few of those like this, I'm going, ooh, I could have cut down on them, some of them fancy words, but. <laughs> so, yeah. Mm -hmm. I really like the final line in Survivors. It's like, I'm not afraid of death, I'm afraid of what it looks like. Mm -hmm. I feel like that's it. Mm -hmm. Bring strength to the people Thank you. Um, I had gone with a friend to Washington, D.C. This was probably several years after my father had passed away. <clears throat> and um, we had just gone on a day trip. And uh, while we were up there, he said, oh, you know, I want to go to uh, the Holocaust Museum. And I said, well, I'm not going in there. He's like, well, why not? And I explained to him that those pictures look way too much like my dad did before he passed away. If you've ever known anyone who um, gets extremely sick from cancer or possibly other diseases, you're all very emaciated, your coloring is, I mean, you don't look like a healthy person. I'm sorry, I'm, I cannot go in there. And so when I explained that to him, he's like, I completely understand. And so um, it can bring back memories very vividly to see an image that even echoes from something in the past. Thank you.